I came across a very interesting and I think well-needed conversation on Twitter recently, and it was started by Jennifer Polk, who wrote the following, as you can see here. You hate online conferences because, number one, you hate conferences. The actual conference parts are boring, and academics get away with boring conferences because people like the other stuff. Two, there is no travel, no having dinner with friends. Those are the parts of conferences you like. The problem isn't there for online conferences. It's folks not putting in the work of creating actually fun and generative events. This is never a priority for on-site events because you didn't have to care to sell tickets, but you need to do it online or else the whole thing is boring. The problem isn't Zoom. It's hosts who refuse to put in the work of learning how the platform works and ensuring all participants have what they need for success technology-wise. The problem isn't that it's online. It's that organizers don't build in ways to connect participants beyond formal sessions. They don't usually even think about non-presenters as participants at all because there's not much meaningful participating for them to do. This is no fun and it's not inviting. Online conferences are the future, and we do actually have the tools to make them awesome. But it's going to take a lot more time and money to pay for expert help than most seem to want to spend. And she followed it up by writing, Instead of flying organizers all over, putting them up in fa bi fancy big city hotels for a week and having them eat expensive and often bad food for every meal, you could spend some of that money on making your online conferences not suck. And then if your objection to online conferences amounts to they aren't the same as in person, well, yeah, they're different. This isn't about a complete one-to-one -one replacement, which of course isn't possible, but that's hardly a justifiable reason to shit on the entire concept for everyone. And I found this quite an interesting post, set of posts, and so did many other people who weighed in. And I'm just going to give you a selection of those. And we begin by looking at people who wanted to rebut her claims. So we have uh, Gailey Bednight, the Belgium appreciator. No, the problem is Zoom and Teams and etc. And online conferences suck and we shouldn't return to 2020. So what are we talking about there? going to the formats that we moved to during COVID when we had to take regular conferences and put them online. I know Macaphasia says something kind of similar. No, online conferences actually do suck. They can be informative if one must attend that way, but all those things that happen natively in person just don't happen by Zoom. Attending a real conference by Zoom is even worse. An ordinary girl wrote, I'm not a medical expert, but I do know about engaging people through communication and experience. This post is precisely why the world stopped Zooming, because no one could fathom how it could possibly be any fun. We create our own fun. New fun takes effort. Put the effort in. And then we get uh, Dr. Luo Ji saying, I disagree. I think the problem is that it is online and that's the same as the problem with online teaching. Knowledge is much better communicated informally in person. And I'm going to pause here for a moment and say it is quite interesting that all of these people know so much about how effective online education is just across the board. It is as if they had done all the work to find out when it's, you know, being seemingly done well, which they don't think it is, and um, when it's, you know, generally not so, and who benefits and who doesn't. Uh, following up with this, we have a few other interesting uh, ones as well. Annette Gordon-Reed writes, I think online conferences are appropriate in many situations, but it's hard for me to imagine my career without the in-person encounters I had at conferences as I was trying to break into the historical profession, I just don't think it would have happened the same way. And this is a, a longer thread. She continues, it was so great to see colleagues from schools around the country who became 
uh, friends that I would see once a year at conferences to have a meal with a young scholar and a prospective editor who would not meet face to face otherwise. It could be that we just can't afford to do this anymore, but it seems too convenient to say that the fact that we can't afford it reflects on the actual substance of the event. Now, notice what she says next. I should say, I know this isn't everybody's experience, but I love seeing groups of young people at conferences getting together laughing and talking about their projects. It can be great for scholars of color who feel isolated in their schools. And a similar response by Peter Johnson here. I've had great learning and social experiences at in-person library conferences and made valuable connections I doubt I would have made remotely. That said, they are expensive, time-consuming, and limiting in who they include. So two, I would say, much more rational, balanced, well, you know, thought-out responses there. Then we get another interesting, and I think quite revealing one, from Liz Heileman. Having covered probably 100-plus medical conferences, I welcome remote options for those who can't or don't want to travel. But I've used dozens of platforms. Some of the sponsors really try to create an interactive experience, and they're just no substitute for in-person. No matter how much money they pour into better platforms, sitting at home in front of your computer is never going to be a substitute for visiting an HIV clinic, uh, Kailisha, or for having dinner and drinks with your colleagues in Paris or Barcelona. Now, that strikes me as two very, very different kinds of things. Visiting an HIV clinic, okay, that's hands-on, real-world experience. Having dinner and drinks with your colleagues, that's networking and schmoozing and stuff like that. And in Paris or Barcelona, that is not quite as relatable, perhaps, for many people in academia or in other venues as well. Then we get to some where maybe there's a little less nuance here. Uh, Tuomas Perinu says, I think this diagnosis is wrong. The problem is precisely the online format. You can't enjoy dinner, drinks, and casual discussions online. Breaks and breakout rooms are contrived, and it's simply impossible to mingle online. There's no way around it. We need on-site conferences. Dr. Simon Albright says, hard disagree. Online sucks because the interactive part of the conference is removed, not because the interactive part is the only bit that's fun. I love learning about advances in and about my field, and it's much more enjoyable when you can discuss it afterwards. Cranky Otter, a favorite author, talks about how the plot is the spine of their book while the character's journey through the plot is the heart of the book. Likewise, the papers and presentations are the spine of a conference, but the interactions about and between the presentations are the heart. Mark Porosoff, online conferences are not the future because conferences are no longer about disseminating information. Conferences are about genuine interactions and connections. These are the humanistic parts of conferences that cannot be emulated online because of millennia of evolution. Finally, Justin Donnelly, what about for younger trainees? Never seen online meetings that can replicate the in-person reality that you can walk up to anyone in your field and strike up a conversation which could become a collaboration or a job. These moments make conferences valuable beyond the actual sessions. And now I have to take a little pause here once again. I find it dubious, both going from my own experience and that from other people that have talked about this, that younger trainees or younger professors or pick whatever else you want, graduate students, can just walk up to anyone in your field and strike up a conversation. Conferences are often just as cliquish as high school was. And, you know, there's very often a, a sort of pecking order of prestige. You don't just go get to walk up to anybody and strike up a conversation. And if you've been able to do that, something tells me you've lived a little bit of a charmed life. And, you know, going back to, to Mark Porosoff's thing, um, conference is no longer about disseminating information. When did that transformation supposedly happen? I 
think that they've always been about networking and schmoozing and all that other kind of stuff in addition to disseminating information as far back as I can remember. All right, so here's an, uh, some other ones. Uh, Dr. Diane Tober, in-person conferences are far more interesting and engaging. The opportunity to travel and eat out and socialize with people I haven't seen in ages, meeting new people. There's no way to make online conferences not flat. They can be okay, but not a substitute. And then we get Margaret Hacker. You've left out other aspects of live conferences, like discovering a new place, a town, a city, or campus, and of course, shopping, bookshops, antiques, clothes. I'm talking Melbourne. As a corollary, I'm wondering how soon the term conference quickie will disappear from our lexicon. So clearly, some people aren't even uh, all about the networking, but are about other perks that come with going to a conference and generally having somebody else paying for it, <laughs> I suspect. Uh, so, and this leads to another great observation, I would say, from Revival Care. Conferences are 95% paid travel and food, 5% actual content and networking. Maybe the gratuitous quasi-vacations need to end to save money and improve equity. Swap to virtual conferences and actually invest in the parts that matter. I think that's a pretty good sentiment there. And we have a few other criticisms of these takes that we've encountered up to this point. Dr. Tracy Wisdom, the fatalism, lack of imagination, and ableism in the replies here are astounding. Online conferences are the future for health inclusion, equity, and environmental reasons. Marta Glowaka says something similar. Every time anyone defends in-person only events, please be honest with yourself. You support exclusion and discrimination. You agreeing that your networking is more important than other people's participation. We get a set of interesting responses here talking about you know, some of the admitted problems that we do have, but how they could be addressed as well. Jason Hartline, half the problem of virtual or hybrid conferences is bad organization and little institutional memory as a different team takes over every year. The other half is the participants not attending virtually in the same way. Both, both must come together at once. Fun Facts with Lulu writes, the problem isn't Zoom, it's hosts who refuse to put in the work of learning how the platform works and ensuring all participants have what they need for success technology-wise. Finally, Rebecca Forden, online conferences could be good. I've been to only one conference that understood participants wanted to participate. It was ABA Tech Show. They created open rooms people could visit between sessions. Speakers hung out after sessions. Ad hoc groups met up. It was lovely. And, you know, this leads into thinking about what would be needed for this. Shea Stewart Booley says, agreed. In 2020, my organization did an amazing online event, but we hired an event planner and it was a good time. Yes, it was uber money, but it was worth it. Unfortunately, people really don't grasp that a good online event is more than just throwing some stuff on Zoom. And then wear a mask, writes, this exactly, I think that's a million percent, online conferences are the future and we do actually have the tools to make them awesome, but it's going to take a lot more time and money to pay for expert help. That was straight from Jennifer Polk's uh, um, tweet. Now, here's some interesting success stories and suggestions. Lauren says, I hosted an online conference in 2020 with a group of student volunteers and a budget of $500, and it was so generative, people got grants off the collaborations, which shows that you definitely can have interaction and you know networking, and you can also do it on a tight budget. Molly M. the Cat says all online conferences need to have water cooler rooms or coffee breaks where people just drop in and out and have a chat. 
and have breakout rooms to talk about anything and everything. I've tried that before, and great friendships were developed after a few sessions. Mind, mind at says, I've been on Zoom virtual conferences where after the formal stuff, there was a social evening where we were encouraged to grab our favorite beverage and join in prearranged games and activities, along with the opportunity to just chat about what we do. It went great. Me in YYJ. One of my usual conferences went online for the first couple of years of the pandemic, and one of the things I loved was a five-minute speed dating round where the RTW platform randomly matched you to another participant to chat for five, then switched you to the next person, networking one-on-one. -on -one. So all of this goes to show that some of these poo-pooings of oh, online things can never be good, made rather dogmatically, um, are refuted in part, not just by theory, but actual practice. There's another set of interesting matters being raised here by uh, Indranil Milik. I so agree with this 1,000%. Every point, we had two plus years to really figure out how to teach, learn, and interact online. We squandered it. So true. Uh, the next one, uh, Dr. Mansur Hasib. Agree, it's the same with online teaching. Taking a boring in-person lecture-based class online will put students to sleep. Yet, that's what a lot of universities did. Of course, it made parents realize how poor some classes are. I've been hosting engaging online conferences since 2018. Sophia Baisada Sun says, here for this take, same problem in industry. Decision makers assume certain things can only be done in person when there are distributed work companies making remote work all day, every day. It takes thought, but no more than in person does or did. Carol B. points out, same with online education. During a short stint as an instructional designer, I started learning how to integrate gamification into the curriculum to improve student engagement. It isn't rocket science. It's either laziness or stuck in old ways of thinking. And then finally, Dr. Jennifer Fegley. I teach engaging online asynchronous courses. We can learn how to design more dynamic online events by looking at successful pedagogical approaches. Furthermore, we can replicate exciting encounters on social media in a conference setting. So many possibilities are ignored. Moving on, we get a number of different reasons why people might, in fact, like online conferences. So I'll read my way through all of these. Bernie uh, Holerda says, I like online conferences because, one, they disrupt my life considerably less. Two, I can still learn new things. Three, I can go back later and just watch the one presentation I need for an idea or project. Four, fast forward through a bad speaker. And five, discussions can be good. Peter Wall Wallentech says, the problem for me is when I travel to a conference, I'm at the conference when it's online uh, or in person, but without travel, I cannot focus on the conference, but do most of my other daily tasks in between. So online conferences now for me are just the talks, and that's okay for me, not needing the networking. Mikalaya says, I love online conferences. I can attend without travel all over the world and actually listen to actually inspiring people. We have very few of those close by. The mingling part isn't my favorite anyway, even less with no one masking these days. Jamie Pierre Junot you know, says, as an introvert, I love online conferences. No awkward icebreakers, the ability to ask questions anonymously. I actually engage more virtually than I ever did in person. Aoden uh, Monaghan says, see, I've always been the opposite. I want to learn the stuff without the awkward, small talk, phony, insincere social stuff that folks will try to pressure you into attending. Online ones are ideal for so many folks for so many reasons. Heather Freelich says, having an active chat is great. Hi, everyone in this panel. Sometimes it is even better to be able to treat the conference papers like a podcast while you do other things beyond just sitting there. Dr. Rebecca Richardson says, I, am, I enjoy Zoom conferences because I actually enjoy the part where I listen to panelists 
And instead of sometimes merely performative Q&A, the chat is a nice way to respond and make connections. Then finally, notes from a life. I love Zoom and online webinars. I love that I don't have to interact and that there might actually be an expert on the other end and I might learn something. I think it's very important to hear from all of these sorts of voices so we can get away from the, well, as we all know, sort of experts chiming in, telling us that networking is absolutely essential. Some people aren't into that or that you can't have the same sort of things in online conferences as you can in face-to-face -face conferences, and they'll always be inferior, and it's a matter of Zoom. I think it's important that we listen to people who say, actually, I enjoy the online stuff. Now, I've got two other ones to finish up with, um, both of which might be a little thought-provoking, perhaps. Elizabeth uh, Lanpier says, to add to the below, Conference content quality has been overall high when online in my experience, possibly because speakers can't just write their presentation on the plane on the way there, revealing a dirty little secret of academic conferences, which is that and it's become a running joke. So many people are actually finishing up their papers on the flight over. Then we have Simon Dixon, kind of agree, but I come to the opposite conclusion. If online conferences are boring and pointless, they are, he thinks, then what are we even doing? It's time for conferences to die. Let's do something else instead. Now, zero suggestion of what that something else would be. And uh, as we see, not everybody does think that online conferences or face-to-face -face conferences are boring and pointless. So we're missing the premise there that uh, Simon thinks we have to have, but you know, we should think about what is the best stuff that we can bring into our immediate future. What can we plan out? What kind of engaging, interesting, high value events could we be doing online or in person. So that's it for this Twitter conversation. Um, I'd be interested to see what you think, and you can put your comments and uh, chime in if you like. Uh, make sure, that, of course, that it's actually about the Twitter thread and the topics that we've been discussing, because we always do want to stay on point. I think that this is actually a very an interesting an important conversation for us to be having. And I'm really glad that uh, Jennifer Polk wrote this out, thought it out, and started a bit of controversy and debate and perhaps even dialogue with this.